Father, would you bless the message today that it come from you? Would this message, Father, be from your voice? Use my mouth, my voice, Father, use me as a vessel, but Father, let it be your word that teaches us today. Teach us something, Father. And we look forward to that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, Franny was talking about worship, and there's all kinds of different things that fall into that category of worship. And uh, singing, praying, um, God's Word, all of those things, uh, the giving of our offerings, these are all acts of worship. And I want to talk to you today about one of those. And this time of year, sometimes we kind of think about this particular one because it's the beginning of the year and you know we got a whole year and, and, and we start thinking about what we can do in terms of the Bible. I want to read a story from the Bible and I want to use it as a launching point for what we're going to talk about today because uh, perhaps you've thought about the Bible like okay maybe I could read the Bible in a year. You ever thought about that or have a reading plan and have a goal of reading the Bible and um, <clears throat> You know, and I've done that. I've done several things like that. I've done book readings. There's just different ways to get more familiar with our Bibles because I gotta tell you, as we look out into society, there are fewer and fewer people that know anything about the Bible. And so we uh, we need to make sure that we're knowing about our Bible and we need to know why. So I wanna talk about that today. I'm gonna use uh, a story in Exodus 3. It's the story of Moses and the burning bush. If you know that story, okay, um, you kind of know what's coming. And even if you haven't actually read it, maybe you've at least heard about it, or maybe you saw Charlton Heston do it in the movie, or you know what I'm saying? It's one of those really great stories that we seem to be familiar with. I want to take a look at it, starting in verse 1, Exodus 3. It says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. A little background here. Moses had spent his life growing up in the palaces of the Pharaoh. He was taught whatever the latest was, even in things like writing and uh, science and the things that they understood. He grew up that way, but when he reached a point in his life, he, because he was a Hebrew, he left that life behind. He also killed a uh, Egyptian uh, uh, soldier who was mistreating, it might have been a soldier, it might have been a, a taskmaster, who was mistreating a Hebrew slave, and for that reason, he had to go into exile. So he's in the land of Midian, he marries a young a girl whose father is Jethro. And Jethro is his father-in-law, and he's a priest of Midian. All right, not a Jewish priest, a priest of Midian. We're not real sure exactly what that looked like, but we know that Pharaoh, uh, that uh, uh, Moses was there, and maybe he was thinking, "This is it. This is this is what I'm going to do the rest of my life." Right? I'm going to tend sheep. I'm retired now. I'm going to tend sheep. I'm going to you know, kind of live out my days in the land of Gideon. But God had another plan, didn't he? God had another plan. He's just minding his own business, and there an angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up sees the bush, gets his attention. God is getting his attention. And he goes towards the bush to find out what this is all about. He could have ran and went the other way. He could have stopped and said, I'm staying right here. But no, he went towards the bush to find out what's going on. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. I can't do the, you know, the theater of God. Moses, I can't do that. Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Wow. What was going through Moses' mind, I wonder? Then he said, God introduces himself. 
I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Okay, now Moses knows who he's dealing with. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Okay, uh, from here, God goes on and gives Moses his mission. The mission is, you know, I'm sending you back to Egypt. Uh, you're going to um, tell Pharaoh to let my people go, okay? Here Moses thought he probably had it made in Midian, just tending some sheep, but no. God has a mission for him. He gives him instructions, okay? And he does it by talking to him through a burning bush. It's kind of a neat story, don't you think? I mean, the stories of the Bible have some really neat and interesting things. Unfortunately, there's lots of people out there who are critics of the Bible and they hear stories like that and they say, you know what? These are stories that are just myths. These are just, these are made up by somebody and this is old and this stuff didn't really happen and you're wasting your time reading your Bible. That's what critics will tell you. Okay? Well, I don't feel that way. I feel completely differently about that. But there's a reason that I do. All right? There's a reason that I do, and maybe there's a reason that you do as well. I'm going to talk about two things today, and two categories. And every one of us is going to fit into one of those two categories. If you're not in the first one, you'll be in the second. We're going to talk about why the Bible might be important to you why you might trust me. All right? That's kind of where we're going today. All right. In order for me to tell you that, I'm going to have to give you kind of my story. I'm going to I'm going to tell you where I came from. Why do I trust the Bible? I mean, why do I read the Bible, a story like what we just read with Moses, and I believe it with all my heart? Well, how come? What's the difference? Why am I not a critic? Well, there's a good reason for that. When I was um, growing up, I was young. I was probably Sarah's age. I was nine or ten. And um, mom and dad always believed and felt that the Bible was very important. Christianity, church, these things were extremely important. And the Bible was it held very high regard in our home. And as a result of that, you know, I had to you know, do things like memorize the books of the Bible. You know. And I could do pretty good when I was younger. I'd get up so far. Usually I'd get up, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Joshua, Ruth. Once I got to Ruth, I usually ran into trouble because I couldn't remember Kings or Chronicles or, or, or Samuel. Anyways, <clears throat> this was something that we did that Mom and Dad felt that you need to memorize these things. Now, I wasn't really liking it much, okay? And, and when I was about 10 years old, um, Dad came home one day with this sheet of paper on both sides, and it had uh, a list, in very fine print, a list of like 100 things to memorize. Um, key verses, key stories. Uh, the books of the Bible was just one line. Um, uh, so I was expected to memorize the um, uh, the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, so the 12 apostles, the, the key stories of Jesus' ministry, um, the prophets of the Old Testament, why were they important? And, you know, what Dad would do is he would bring this thing out at dinner time, because that's usually when we got together, we all got together at dinner time, and we'd sit down at the table for dinner, you know, I'll come up and sheet, and I'd I don't know what my body language was like, but I'm sure it was like, I'm sure I'm rolling my eyes and thinking, oh, please, can we, all right, we got, if I'm going to eat, I guess we better have to do this. And, uh, you know, because, and, and aren't kids like that sometimes? When we want them to do things that we know are important, they, they kind of, I don't want to do that. And, 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 and sometimes it's not good to give in to that. I am very grateful to mom and dad that they did this because it, it really, helped me in the years that followed. It helped me a lot. I'm so grateful that Dad 
decided that, and he, he, he stuck to it. And uh, there were just some really key things that, that I learned about the Bible. But here's the problem. I memorized and knew things about the Bible. I knew things about God. I knew key people, key stories. I thought some of them were pretty cool. But none of them really connected with me. These are old stories, old things that used to happen. Uh, some of Jesus' miracles were pretty cool, you know. But what does that have to do with me, really? Well, when I was a little later, a little past 10, <laughs> say my late 30s, early 40s, uh, I was in one of these, you know, we've talked about hills and valleys in life. We've talked about that. And there's just times that we're in high places and we're doing great, and there's other times when we're just not doing so great. I was in a pretty low valley <clears throat> in my late 30s, early 40s. Uh, my first marriage was broken. Uh, this was years before I met Kathy. Uh, I had three kids at home to feed, to keep them out of trouble, deal with school. Um, do the midnight runs to Kmart. Thank God Kmart was open 24 hours because the, the science project was due the next day. Uh, <laughs> all these things are going on. I'm kind of mom and dad taking care of the kids. And then also work was, the demands of work were very high at that time. Um, does anybody remember Y2K? You guys remember Y2K? Well, uh, I was on a team at work. Uh, for the last year and a half, between year and a half and two years, leading up to Y2K, to uh, test all of our systems in the plant, uh, in several plants actually, computer systems, control systems, uh, small little things, what's gonna happen when the clocks turn over. If you thought that we didn't know what was gonna happen at midnight in 2000, I gotta tell you, we knew exactly what was gonna happen, because every one of those clocks turned over. We, we did it, we turned them over, we tested them. And my boss was, uh, wanted a feather in his cap for how much we were getting done and he really wanted me to work a lot, a lot of hours. And I said, look, I can't do that. I got kids at home. I can't work this weekend. I got responsibilities. And my boss didn't like that because he was thinking about how he was going to look. And uh, so I started getting some really crummy assignments uh, at work, things that didn't matter. It was just kind of like farm me out somewhere. It was like punishment or something. I don't know. Anyways, um, there was this heavy, low period in my life, and I just felt like I was, I felt like I was alone. I had church family. I had people, friends at work. I had friends outside of work. You know, you can have friends. You can be surrounded by people, and you can still be alone. And I just felt kind of empty. And uh, one day, was drawn to uh, Psalm 40. And uh, I'll explain to you how that happened. I was drawn to Psalm 40 and I decided to read Psalm 40 and it, it something clicked, something changed in my life. Okay, I want to share it with you. Psalm 40, um, because this isn't about just memorizing things. It's not just about knowing about the Bible. This was different. Psalm 40, verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. And I felt like, yeah, I, I can associate with that. That's King David. Da King David went through some horrible things in his life. And um, he had some real low points. So he's reminiscing about when that used to be. And I'm looking at that and I'm saying, yeah, I can associate with that. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. Okay, I can, that's a little extreme for me, but okay, I'll take it. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Yeah, I get that. That's, that's what I want. 
He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. I said, I, said, I want that. And what I began to realize as I kind of poured over, and I read the rest of Psalm 40, and there was other things in there that were very meaningful to me. But I began to realize something. This is, wait a minute, this isn't just about, this isn't just about King David. This isn't just about him. I was drawn to Psalm 40 for a reason. This is about me. This is something that God is speaking into my life. And I began to look at this very carefully. He turned to me and he heard my cry. I don't even remember what I was praying in those days. I, I know that I was feeling bad and feeling down. But whatever I was saying, he heard me. He heard me. Not just King David. He heard me. He heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit. It's like this is what God's going to do. This is what God is going to do with my life. Out of the mud and the mire. Ever get stuck in the mud? And it's hard to move. I felt like I was, it was hard to move. He set my feet on a rock and he gave me a firm place to stand. I began to realize this is something that God is going to do. He's, this is more than just a psalm of David. I began to realize as I was reading it that God is speaking into my life. Something for me. Personalized, okay? He put a new song in my mouth, in my mouth. A hymn of praise to our God. Wow. Not only did I want that, I began to expect that. And I began to look for how he was going to do that. And, you know, God did do that. Uh, a few years later, I mean, several things began to change on my job, and, and the kids were doing well. Nobody went to prison. <laughs> okay. Uh, everybody's still alive. And I began to experience this right here. This began to be a reflection of me. And, and what makes it different? What makes it different for me and what I'm hoping would make it different for you is when it becomes a personal connection. When the Bible becomes personal to you, you know, the critics can say all they want about the Bible. They can say all kinds of stuff. But I know what God has said to me. An experience is different than just knowing about things. I knew about the Bible. I knew lots of things. And I, and I knew other people, too, that knew their Bibles and could spew all kinds of Bible verses. Now, their lives did not reflect them at all. But they sure knew their Bible verses, right? Yeah. You ever met anybody like yes. that? Yes. yes. It's, like, it's, it's not knowing about it. It's when it becomes personal. And your life begins to live and you begin to change because God is doing a change in your life. It becomes personal connection, okay? And I've, I just always, I've hung on to that. I mean, I, I looked at lots of Psalms, Psalm 37, Psalm 90. There was a bunch of Psalms that just seemed to leap out at me during that time of my life. And I began to realize this is not just print on a page. It's not just guys who wrote things a long time ago. God is actually, this, this stuff was written 2,500 years ago and God is using it to talk to me right now. When you know that's true and it becomes a personal connection, you think about the Bible completely different. Okay? Last year when Kathy and I were on vacation, we were in uh, Tennessee and in some of these places that you go, um, there's the, you know, there's all kinds of oh, gift shops, souvenir shops, you know, uh, everything's turned commercialized in some of these places. And, and so, yeah, we walk around, we go to some of these shops, and, and Kathy really loves, she enjoys that a lot. She, she's looking in the shops maybe for the next treasure that she might find, and I'm looking for the husband bench. Okay? <laughs> and not all stores had husband benches, so 
I was in some of these shops, and, and I'm okay with it too, but I'm, I'm like a two minute guy. You know, a couple minutes and I'm done, okay? And uh, Kathy's not a two minute person. So we're in the store, we're looking around in the store and uh, some interesting things. My eye caught something and it was a picture. And I looked at this picture and I was just mesmerized by this picture. It was a, it was a painting, a copy of a painting. Okay, and I went around the store, I looked at some other things. I kept coming back to that picture. And I realized as I was walking around the store, I gotta buy that picture. <laughs> that is a great picture. That picture is about me. Okay, and I've got it in the in the office, it's on the desk there. This is the picture I saw. And what it reflects, it reflects when Jesus walked on the water. And when Peter sank, and Jesus is reaching to rescue Peter, right? Well, this is about us, okay? This is about Jesus rescuing you, rescuing me, okay? Uh, the really neat thing about this picture, um, and this often happens. Um, I, I told Franny what I was talking about today, but the only thing I told her was... Um, that I was talking about the Bible and how we relate to it in a personal way. That's all I told her. Right? Well, she picks the song Oceans, right? <laughs> the place where our feet fail, right? Good choice. <laughs> well, God has a way of working those things out, okay? And bringing things to our minds. Uh, the second song we sang, um, Here I Am to Worship. I don't know if you noticed, but it ended with Psalm 40, verse 3. <laughs> put a new song in my heart right it was there so it's kind of neat when those things come together and, and, and maybe that's not always obvious to you but it becomes incredibly obvious to me when those things happen okay this is about being rescued this is what Jesus is doing King David's life my life your life and it's right now it's a it's about rescuing it's a great picture. I love that picture. And when it becomes personal, and when you know that you're getting talked to, okay, Moses was talked to out of a bush, right? And what a change it made in his life because God was actually speaking to him. When you make a personal connection, it becomes personal. Now it doesn't matter what they say. They can say all they want. I know that God's word is from him. Okay, I know that. Okay, the other one is pretty simple, isn't it? People who have not yet had a personal connection. That's not too hard, just the flip side. People that are critics, people that are uh, quick to say that the Bible is not reliable, it's not uh, uh, accurate, it's been mistranslated over the years, they completely discount the spiritual aspect of what's going on here with our Bibles. They completely do. They don't understand the personal connection of how God uses that to speak into our lives. They don't understand the spiritual component of how the words were, were put together and how they are delivered to us. They don't understand that. And so because they don't have that personal connection, they don't understand how important our Bibles are to us. Peter tells us a little bit about that in 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 19. He tells us, this about our Bibles because he's he's telling the, the, the church about a little story where he and, and James and John were with Jesus on a mountain and there was this thing that happened called the transfiguration, right? It's a vision. It's a miracle of Jesus standing in a vision with Moses and Elijah. Moses is the law, Elijah is the prophets, and Jesus is in the middle and he's over all of that. They get a real personal connection with the transfiguration. But you know what? Not everybody gets to have a transfiguration. Not all the disciples did be because it was only Peter, James, and John. Not everybody has the same experience. So Peter says, okay, for the rest of you, right? He says this, we also have the prophetic message, and he's talking about <clears throat> the law, the prophets, the wisdom, what we call the Old Testament. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. Completely reliable. And you would do well to pay attention to it. 
Sounds like pretty good advice. You would do well. Pay attention to it. As to a light, just like you would see, pay attention to a light shining in a dark place. And we know that light always overpowers darkness. As to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. It's very poetic, isn't it? Very poetic. But it has great meaning. Who is the morning star? Jesus is always the morning star in Scripture. In several places. Jesus rises. He says, you pay attention, the same way you would pay attention to a light shining into a dark place, until the day, there's a day that comes in your life that dawns. For me, that day came when I was drawn to Psalm 40. And the morning star, Jesus, rises in your hearts. It's personal to you. Now, some people attribute this to the return of Jesus, and it can be, but because he's talking about rising in your hearts, and because he's talking about the transfiguration, and he's saying, but we have the prophetic message, I think he's talking about what the Bible should mean to us. Completely reliable. We would do well to, to pay attention to it, right? And the day is going to come when Jesus, the morning star, is going to rise in your hearts. You're going you're gonna to have, it's going to become personal to you. He goes on and he says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by a prophet's own interpretation of things. That's what the critics want to argue. They, people just wrote down stories and myths. But Peter's saying, no, this is not what happened. Yes, they were men, okay? Prophecy never had the origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The prophets writing didn't even really totally understand what they were writing or why. God was using it to speak to you and I and everybody else through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings the words together and puts them into print, right? The Holy Spirit also is the one who delivers those, those words to you. It's a two-way street. They were, it was used to put them in, and it's used to speak to you. Because it's God speaking by the Holy Spirit. When Moses was at the burning bush, God spoke to him through the angel of the Lord in the bush. Today, we have God's Word speaking to us, spoken from God, by and through the Holy Spirit. And it's to you. It's to you. So, here's the thing. You may be a person... Or you may not be. You, if you're in one, you're you're in one or the other of those two categories. And maybe you're in a place where, yeah, the Bible's pretty interesting, but really, I don't know. It's about things and times and places and history and <coughs> stories. And some of them might be myths. If you're in that place, it's because you need a personal connection with. It. So how do you do that? Do you wait for God to bring a burning bush to you? <laughs> well, it's probably not going to happen that way. But there is something we can do, and it's called seeking. You know, even if you're a person that's like, I don't know about this, do yourself a favor. Do some seeking. Check into it to see if it is so. All right? How do we do that? Well, it starts with prayer. Prayer is the conduit to God that we ask God to bring us understanding. It's prayer. Remember Psalm 40 where it says, I, I heard your cry. I don't even remember what I was saying to God. You ever, you ever feel that way where you're so empty, you're so buried, you don't even remember what you said. You ever, you ever experienced that? Well, God hears what you can't even express. And prayer is the great way to say, Lord, I don't know about this Bible thing, but if you could just show me what it means to me personally, that's a great way to start. Okay, uh, devotions. When I say devotions, um, simple Bible readings that you can look into. Now, we have this little thing called the Daily Bread, right? They're on the table back there. It doesn't take very long to read one page. 
but it has a verse in it. And it might be the very thing that God is speaking to you about, where you can look at it and say, wow, I can really associate with that. That sounds like something that I'm dealing with. God can use that. Very simple thing. How long does that take? It doesn't take very long, but you can, you can start to see where God is maybe saying something to you. Um, if you've got a smartphone, I know some of you do, some of you don't. If you've got a smartphone or a tablet or a computer, they've got these really neat Bible apps. This is the one that I would recommend. It comes from life.church. There's a few of them out there. You know, I wish I had this back when I was searching. It would have made it a lot easier, but you know, God made sure that I found what I needed to find. But this is, is in so many languages today. It's taking the storm in all these other countries where you can't be a Christian, but you can download a map and have a Bible on your phone. It's really cool. It's really making a difference in countries that is, uh, they still have internet, but they're not allowed to be Christians. Okay, and, and the neat thing about it, this is 2 Corinthians, but um, uh, if you, you can read it, or you can even <clears throat> hit the play button and it'll read it to you. <laughs> That's really cool. And, and you can't see it up here because my volume thing got in the way, but uh, there's a little search thing up here. You can search for anything you, you put in any word you want. Any question you have. It'll take you to some really amazing places. I mean, these are the uh, when I was searching for Psalm 40, I had I had a concordance in the back of the Bible, and I had to do some digging, and I did find it. I did find it, but it wasn't easy like it is today. If you're a person that's just not sure how my Bible connects with you personally, prayer and devotion. Spend spend a few minutes, even just a few minutes. Didn't Joe say? Joe said something, and I wrote it down, about the little things. Mm -hmm. He said, little things of God can also become much bigger over time. Simple habits like prayer, scripture, memorization, uh, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, add up over time. God can use the smallest of gestures. The smallest of gestures. So, <clears throat> you know what? A little bit of searching, a little bit of seeking make a difference. Another category, music. Music. God reaches us through music. That's how God draw me, drew me into Psalm 40. It was a song. I heard a song. The words in the song said something about placing my feet on a rock and giving me a new song. In my, in my heart, it said heart, not mouth, because Sounds, sounds better in song to say hard. Same thing. Those words got to me, and I started to look, where does that say that? And that's how I found Psalm 40. And when I rest, read the rest of Psalm 40, I realized this is talking to me. It's making a personal connection. Music is another wonderful way. Surround yourself. 90.7 in the car or at home. 88.3, there's Christian music available. If, if, the question is, what do you want to surround yourself with? Consider surrounding yourself with these simple things and try it. Because there's lots of other choices out there. So, I want to go back to Exodus 3, and I want to reread the story of Moses. Because I want to point out a couple things. All right? Moses basically just minding his own business. Not necessarily even reaching out for God at this point, was he? God reached out to him, didn't he? Right? But when he saw the burning bush, what did he do? He said, I will go over and see this thing. He was seeking. He didn't know what he was seeking. He didn't know why. He went to get closer to the burning bush, didn't he? He took a step to get closer. And you know what happened? When God saw that he had gone over to do that, that's when he spoke to him. God called to him within the bush. Uh, I don't know, maybe if Moses would have stood there or ran away, maybe nothing would have happened. God would have to do something else. But because he went to look, God called to him from within the bush, right? 
And then he gave him his instructions. Okay? This sentence right here. You ever wonder what this means? Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, what, what is, why does God want him to take his sandals off? I mean, there's a kind of a movement out there about the holiness of God. And that God is holy and we are not. And we can't be in the presence of God because he is holy and we are not. Well, you know what? He took the sandals off, right? But I got a feeling Moses' feet weren't any cleaner. I doubt it, right? I suspect that his feet were just as dirty as his sandals. Is it really about the dirt? Is that what it's about? Or is it about something else? He says, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. The ground is dirt, but it's holy because why? God's presence is there. He makes that holy. And I guess he could have made the sandals holy too, but think about it. With the sandals removed, now Moses' foot, the skin of his foot, is now connected to that holy ground. And could it be that God didn't want anything to separate Moses from him? Could it be that the holiness of God wanted him to touch so that there's not an insulator, there's not something insulating between Moses and God. Take off those sandals and touch this holy ground, right? It kind of makes me think about our Bibles because it's called the Holy Bible, is it not? Yeah, it says right there, Holy Bible, look at that. It's holy because God is in it. But maybe it means we've got to touch the pages We've got, to, we've got to come in contact with the Holy Word, His Word, and make a personal connection. Moses is making a connection with his feet, right? And there's nothing coming between God and him. Sometimes we have, may have to think of our own lives and maybe think about things that we have to take off because it's coming between God and us. Maybe it's things that are filling our life with other things. And maybe God is asking you to take off your sandals and be in contact with Him because by being connected to His holiness makes you holy. Yeah, your, your feet are still dirty, okay? You still have sin in your life, but that's why God sent His Son to deal with that sin and even become sin. People that say that God cannot be around dirty human beings. Well, he sent his son to be one of those, to take on the sin of the world, and to become sin. That's pretty... That's pretty connected to our dirtiness, I guess you could say. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Is there anything in our lives that we may want to consider getting rid of because it's coming between God us. Maybe it's even keeping us from taking the time that it would take to look into his word. Okay, there's lots of things going on in life. It's just something to think about. Okay? Psalm 40 to me is something very personal because I feel it was God talking to me in that moment and telling me what he was going to do. And he did lift me. He did set my feet on a rock. He did put a new song in my, in my heart, in my mouth, my heart. Way. And now it's personal. And that's why somebody talks about the Bible as being a book of myths. I can say, look, you, you have made a personal connection, so you don't know what you're talking about. I know because I've experienced I've experienced God talking into my life. See this phrase? Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. Why would he be saying that? Could it be that if my life and my connection and my lifting and my new song, could it be affecting other people around me so that they see it? 
and they see a change and they see something happening and maybe because of that they will put their trust in him too yeah yeah many will see what God has done and put their trust in him that sounds like something that God is doing through our lives okay some takeaways let's wrap it up Okay, we're talking about the Bible, right? We're talking about the book that maybe, maybe you are like me and said, well, yeah, it's interesting and it's got some great stories and history, history, I love history. But has it made a connection with you personally? Has it? Have you felt that God has talked to you through his holy work? Have you thought about taking some sandals off <laughs> that might be insulating you from being able to look into his word. The Bible is your personal connection. We pray to God. That's our speaking to him. He speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word. It is your personal connection. And I'll go out on a limb here and say this. The Bible is also your burning bush. <laughs> it's your burning bush. God speaks to through the Holy Spirit to your life. It's like you have the burning bush and you have one or two. I don't know how many Bibles you have. They're all burning bushes. God says, take your sandals off. You're standing on holy ground. Be connected to it. Skin to his word. Touch the pages. Turn the pages. Read the pages. God will speak to you in your life. If you decide to do that, even if you're not sure about it, make that decision. Your life will never be the same, I'll tell you that. Think about that this year, 2018. Father, we praise your name today. We absolutely thank you for your word. And Father, your word is spoken to us by you through the Holy Spirit, through the hands of the, the men who have written it, the ladies even in there who have spoken things that are in that word, Father. Father, you will use people to teach us and to speak to us. And Father, we thank you for that. Father, uh, there are many who don't believe this, and we pray for them, and we pray that they will have a personal connection too. And Father, we pray that they will look into it and not run away. But Father, uh, lift us. Lift us out of our our hard places, our, the mud and the mire that we find ourselves in from time to time, Father. Would you lift us out, just like you said in Psalm 40. Father, would you speak to us so that we know that you are doing that and you will do that. And we can put our trust in you. And other people that see us trusting you, they will trust you too. Father, you have said, you have spoken this. We praise you today. We thank you for your son, Jesus for coming to be sin for us so that we don't have to worry about the dirt on the ground because you make everything holy. We need to confess to you. We need to bring them to you. We need to acknowledge you in our lives. And Father, you bring forgiveness. And we thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name we praise you and thank you. Amen. Amen. You know, God has been really good to us. Absolutely been very good to us. You know, you got words that are spoken 2,500, 3,000 years ago, or even as recent as, recent as 2,000 years ago, right? They're absolutely reliable. They're from God. He speaks into your life through the Holy Spirit, and He wants to do that to you as well.